gospel lesson for today, for this first Sunday in Lent, is taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, then command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city and placed Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to the devil, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to test. And again, the devil took Jesus aside to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in all their splendor. And he said, to Jesus, all of these I will give to you, if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only, him alone. Then the devil left Jesus, and suddenly angels came, and they ministered to him. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on this first Sunday in Lent, we thank you for the opportunity to gather at St. Paul's Wurtenberg today. Open our hearts and minds as we prepare to wrestle with this very important gospel lesson, the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, way back at the beginning of his earthly ministry. Open our hearts and minds, help us to understand this text and apply it to our life in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, now, okay, roll up your sleeves here. This is going to be really interesting. It's the first Sunday in Lent, first Sunday in Lent. This is the traditional reading in all three lectionary cycles. We read the temptation story from Matthew, from Mark, and from Luke. This year, we're going to go through the Matthew temptation story. So everything you know about Matthew so far, pull out all the stops and focus on that. So here we go. Let's go to work on this thing. First of all, when does the story take place? It's always good to get the context. It's Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 3 features the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. So he goes from the baptism right into the wilderness. So that's the context of this. And it's the beginning of his three and a half year earthly ministry. Remember, at his baptism, what does the, the voice of the Father say? This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. He goes from that to this. Now, is this called the temptation of Christ? Well, not really. Let's get this out of the way right away. Uh, you might have seen the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ. Excellent movie. Watch the movie. Study the movie. Very important. The temptation of Christ is not just these three things. Mm -hmm. It isn't just, oh, once he made it through, you know, Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, well, then it's uh, green lights all the way to Highway 84 down, you know, yeah, that's not what this means. Jesus is tempted and tried, tested, over and over again. His whole life, the whole three and a half years of ministry, right? And the, the, the most outrageous one is when Peter comes up and says, you know, Jesus, who do men say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ. And then, then, he, then Jesus says, I must go and be betrayed and be crucified. Peter says, oh, no, I'm not going to let that happen. That's a temptation from the inner circle. So the temptations of Christ come from all angles and everywhere, including even his most trusted advisor is trying to derail him from going to the cross, dying on the cross. Remember, this is what it's all about, the DBR, death for resurrection. So the, the temptation means this. Um, you're out in Colorado, let's say, you know, you, you find a rock and it has, it looks like gold on it, right? So you, you say, this is gold. No. 
you take that gold and you test it to see if it's pyrite, if it's fool's gold or not, right? So once it has been tested, then the gold is valuable, isn't it? It has to be tried and tested first to approve. It isn't just like, it looks like it could be real gold. That doesn't have any value. But once it's tested, and here's a certificate proving it, guess what? That's what, the, that's what the temptation of Christ is all about. What's the big thing? When you come to church for 52 weeks out of the year, our gospel lesson, we, we talk about who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? It's from multiple different angles. Who is he? Do you want to believe in a, in a God who is like weak and wobbly? Do you want, or do you want to believe in a God that's been tested and proven? He's the real deal. He's really gold with a certificate on it. That's what this is all about. So when you look at the temptation, you need to say it's an ongoing temptation, but these three are selected so that you may know who Jesus is. He is worthy to die on the cross for you. Now, back up a little bit. Um, well, here, let, let's just plunge right in, all right? So Jesus is driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Stop. Is being driven into the wilderness an accident or a mistake? He, he programmed the wrong location on his GPS, and he, he wandered off into the... No, the Holy Spirit leads him to the wilderness. Got that? So Jesus is there on his own free will and accord. He doesn't just wander into the, you know, I got lost or something, you know? That happened one time, I got lost down there in Hyde Park. I didn't know how to get out of there, right? No, that's not what this is all about. He's driven there on purpose, and he's in the wilderness. Okay, stop, red flags, right? wilderness, wilderness. When you hear the word wilderness, you should say, oh, I remember now, Moses leads the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. How many years? 40 years. You see, in Matthew, Matthew is writing about Jesus through the lens of Jewish Christians, people that know the Old Testament. So Jesus is a mini Moses. He's a mini Israel being recapitulated, right? All these Old Testament themes keep popping up over and over and over again. So to understand who Jesus is, he's going to be recapitulating the wilderness wandering of the children of Israel where they were what? Tried and tested. Got that? 40. So the wilderness is a place of being tried. Now stop here for one second here, right? Uh, the Romans are city people, Chivitas civilization, right? They, 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 they say, who lives in the country? Pagans live in the country, mm -hmm. right? So the wilderness is the worst case scenario for these people. You don't want to be in the wilderness. What's in the wilderness? No law and order. They don't have any, there's no Roman legions out making sure the countryside is safe. There's wild animals on the loose. Back in Jesus' day, they had things like bears and lions, right? and jackals and hyenas and all kinds of nasty stuff out there, including snakes of all kinds. You don't want to be in the wilderness, especially you don't want to be in the wilderness. How? By yourself? By yourself? You know the parable of Good Samaritan? What happened to the, to the victim? He's accosted and beaten by robbers because he's by himself. You don't go, no-go zone. Certain places you don't go by yourself. And if you do get attacked, it's probably your fault. So in the wilderness alone, what would happen? if you'd break an ankle or something. One time Mrs. Isaacs dragged me up to Alaska and we're on, this, on, the, on the train going up to the, you know, uh, Denali State Park, you know, and I'm, I'm on the back of the train looking out. I'm thinking, if you fell off this train, you'd be dead. Trying to live off the, I mean, there's, there's like wilderness, nothing there. It's like a rainforest sort of too. It isn't like, like this, frozen ground. No, it's like mushy, mossy kind of stuff with grizzly bears running around. I'd probably last about a half hour there, and I was in the Boy Scouts. Right? A normal person would probably last about three minutes, right? No, so, so the wilderness is like that. It's a hostile environment. This is not like, oh, I want to go to the wilderness and make candles and, and talk about beat poetry up in Woodstock or something. That's what this is all about. The wilderness is like a danger zone. Danger, danger, okay? So Jesus is in the wilderness, and he's there for what? He's there for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 is what? The number of trial and testing. How do we do the life of Jesus, or life of Moses? 40, 40, 40. 40 years in the court of Pharaoh, 40 years in the wilderness watching his follow-on Jethro's sheep, 40 years leading the children of Israel. How about uh, the first three kings of Israel? Saul, David, and Solomon. 
40 years, 40 years, and 40 years. 40 is the number of trial and testing. So he's in the wilderness for 40 days. Now this happened, I'm not making this up, right? I'm well informed because I have like Facebook and stuff, you know. I watch TV a lot in the news. About two weeks ago, there was a pastor, probably from Oklahoma. You know, they read the Bible down there and they really believe it. You know, that's why I like these people. Well, he gets to read one time and he goes, hmm, Jesus fasted for 40 days. I like Jesus. I'm going to do the same thing. So no food or water for 40 days. He died in the 39th day. That's a real thing, right? So surprise, ready? After 40 days, Jesus was famished. You got that? Now, this isn't like a fake thing. It's like, oh, well, he probably had like pizzas delivered or something. You know, there's like a loophole somewhere. No, he, Jesus is 100% God and 100% what? Man. Oh, okay, so when, you, when he's famished, he's just like you. If you didn't eat for 40, I fast a lot, you know, I do. Between breakfast and lunch. I, I have got this down. I, I'm really spiritually disciplined. What a, what a focus here. What a, yes, uh, right? No, so 40 days, so he's really famished. Now, when does, when does Satan decide to make an appearance? Does he make an appearance just as Jesus is walking out of the water after being baptized by, by John the Baptist and having the, the father say, this is my son? I'm, that's a spiritual high point. Now, Satan attacks when you're at your lowest point. What is Satan anyway? He's like a jackal, a hyena. He's a predator. He's on the prowl. He's on a, like a lion. You ever watch the nature shows? We watch them all the time, right? And so the wildebeest are out there, and what are the what are the what are the what are the predators do? They sit there by the edge and they watch, and they're looking for young ones and they're looking for old ones, and that's the ones who they peel off and pick off. They're not going to go after a a middle aged. Uh, wildebeest that knows how to evade predators, they're going to go after the weak and the lame and the people that are frail. That's who Satan attacks. He attacks you when you're down, not when you're up. Right? When does Satan attack? When Jesus is 40 days, 40 days of not eating, 48 days of being by himself in the wilderness, 40 days. That's when Satan moves in for the kill. Satan is like a prowling beast, a vicious predator. So here we go then. Uh, the tempter. Okay, see that? So here's, we have three temptations. Okay, ready? There are three spheres or domains of human existence. This is like atheist secular stuff that they teach in college, you know? You know? So three spheres of human activity, right? It's the economic sphere, the religious sphere, and the political sphere. If you can get those three things underway, you'd be, you know, that's a liberal arts degree right there, to know those three things, okay? So Satan attacks you and attacks Jesus in the three spheres of human activity, the three big things, the three biggies, okay? So the first temptation is this. If, okay, stop. It's a pattern here, okay? If, then statements. That's called a condition. It's quid pro quo. What does that mean? If you contribute to my campaign, then I'll give you the special benefit, the stadium you've always wanted in Buffalo. Okay, see how that works? It's called a quid pro quo. If then, if then. Does God work that way? No. no. Jesus says this, because I died for you, therefore you have eternal life through faith in me. You see? Satan is the ape of God. He imitates God. What does Satan want anyway? He wants you to worship him like he's a god. You know the yin and yang symbol, you know? Big Richie probably has a tattoo like that, you know, yin and yang. The, the round means the universe. The half dark side and the half light side means that good and evil are balanced in the universe. Is that true? No, it's a lie. Satan wants you to think that's true. Satan is a created being. In other words, there was a time when there was no Satan. Satan is a fallen angel. And demons are the one-third of the angels that were cast out of heaven with him. Satan is not omnipresent, omniscient. Those are attributes that we, have, that we give to God alone. He's a created being, but he wants you to think he is God. He wants you to worship him, and to, he wants you to worship and fear him. He tries to rob God of the glory that's only due to God, you see? 
And so when Satan makes a promise, okay, stop. Remember I said pay attention to the prayer. Okay, this prayer is really good. If you got this prayer done, you can pretty much go home today, right? God is our strength. So this is why we played a mighty fortress. This is our first hymn. He's in our struggle between good and evil. We, we fight a war against the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what it means to be a Christian human living right here and now. We, have, we fight against good and evil on a constant basis. And where is it? It's within us and it's outside of us at the same time. And you know, the worst one is not really the outside evil, it's the inside evil that you have to wrestle with. That's what Lent is all about, to call attention to that. And what is the devil? The devil and all the forces that defy God, they tempt us with empty promises. Okay, you got this? Don't ever forget this. Satan is a liar. He's a murderer, he's a slanderer, he's a liar, okay? So what does Satan do? If you, then I will. Yeah, if you want to party, if you really want to have a good time, yeah, you stick the heroin needle in your arm. It's a really good time. Oh, it's so much fun. But of course, is that a lie? It's not a good time. In the short term, you might think it's a good time to be walking around like the walking dead or something. But in the long term, you're hooked, you're dead, he's got you. That's what Satan does. It feels good in the short term, in the long term, you're dead. Satan wants you dead. He, he's a murderer, right? And he lies and manipulates and he steals something that would be good and positive. Is it good to have pain-killing medication? Yes, it is, right? If you're going through a disease or something, but it's not good to have pain-killing medication if you're, you know, uh, sober and uh, 19 years old or whatever, right? You see how that works? Satan lies to you in order to, and, and it's a short-term pleasure and the long term, you're, you're dead. That's how he operates. That's how Satan rolls, right? Whereas with God, it's the opposite. He promises you, you know, uh, maybe life might be a little tough here, a life of discipline and focus, you know? Do I like, did I like going to college and going to school all those years? Actually, I did. No, it's actually hard work. But at the end, you get a reward. You get a certificate, a diploma, you get a job, and you have a career, and you have a life. And so in other words, hard work when you're young, girls, right? You work really hard in school now so that when you get older, you'll be able to be a responsible citizen, a good mother, a good, a good person. That's why you do it, right? Well, yeah, but isn't there a shortcut? Satan is the champion of the shortcut. You're supposed to, oh, look, you can send in $10 and you can be an ordained minister. You don't have to go to any school. You don't have to study anything at all. Well, that's taking a shortcut. That's right. You have to work the program the whole road. You have to walk the whole road, right? Extremely important, right? Do you want to go to an incompetent brain surgeon? I don't. You want to go to one that's highly trained and skilled, that has all the certificates, has a, that did the thing. The shortcut is what Satan talks about. Oh, you don't need to do that. You, you, you know so much already anyway. You just do a shortcut. Satan is the, is the liar who tries to get you to take shortcuts. So if then, is, that's how Satan does it. So he, what does he say at the first temptation? He says, if you are the son of God, stop. Does Satan know yes. that Jesus is the Son of God? Absolutely. How does he know? Well, remember Herod the Great? Herod the Great sends his boys out to Bethlehem to slaughter the innocents. All boys two years old and under are supposed to be killed. Why? Because Satan is using Herod to try to wipe out the Messiah. Satan knows who, who, who Jesus is. Why would Satan be wasting his time tempting uh, Jesus in the wilderness? He's probably got better things to do if he thought Jesus was, a, was like a fake or wasn't really the son of God. Satan is, is devoting time and resources to try to derail Jesus. That's his big thing. He wants to prevent this from happening above all. He wants to keep him off the cross, right? No bloody sacrifice of Jesus. He wants to get rid of that and, you know, oh, you can just think the right thoughts and that'll save you. You don't have to go through faith in Christ stuff, okay? So he knows who he is, but why? Satan is a liar, isn't he? And he's a manipulator. He's a cheater, a liar, a manipulator, a murderer. Well, if you're the son of God, then command these stones to become loaves of bread. What is this? The economic temptation. Economic temptation. What does that mean? Something out of nothing. Now, have you heard this before? 
God created the heaven and the earth, right? Genesis 1. It's called ex nihilo. Ex nihilo. What does that mean? Out of nothing. God alone can speak the universe into existence. That's what it means to be God. Ex nihilo. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He spoke it, and the universe is created. If you say, I can create something out of nothing, you, what are you doing? You're trying to rob God's glory and power. You're trying to say, yeah, you can create something out of nothing, right? Ludwig von Mises, the great Austrian economist, wrote an essay back in the early 40s that's called Stones Out of Bread, or Bread Out of Stones. Mm. He's alluding to this, right? Things like, can you just print money that's not backed by anything? You know, uh, like crypto co cryptocurrency stuff. Just, 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 we'll just call it money and everybody will, you know. No, you can't do that. Something out of nothing is a lie from Satan. You got that? It's extremely important. And so the, 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 the great economic lie is that, well, if you can do bread, bread and circuses, how did the Romans keep power so, for so long? A thousand years? They kept power by giving the people in Rome, the mobs in Rome, free bread and free circuses and the Colosseum. Sports and entertainment along with free stuff. Are you kidding me? That's an ancient Roman way of keeping political power. And what happens when you take the free stuff, you take the free stuff, you take the next thing you know, it's like, you know, I don't really feel like working. It's beneath my dignity to have to work. I'll just, I'll just have free stuff coming at me all the time. Right? You get addicted to the what? Free stuff. The short-term gain. Oh, the free stuff. It feels so good to have heroin. In the long run, you're dead. It will literally kill the economy. Doing free stuff all that. Free stuff, free stuff. Well, bread, that's what this is. If Jesus could say to the stones, and there's a lot of stones in Israel, there's rocks everywhere, bread, 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 hand it out to everybody, bread, 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 bread. Well, guess what? He'd be the most popular person in town. People would line up, right? Mussolini makes the trains run on time. Hitler gave out benefits, free stuff to people. Everybody, hey, hey Hitler's a great guy, but he built the Autobahns, right? That's how they do it. So bread is an economic temptation. If you had the power to make something out of nothing, right, you could, you think some politician would be willing to maybe do that? Yeah, oh yeah, are you kidding me? People have sold out for a lot less than that. So the economic temptation is bread. Bread, something out of nothing. He's, again, God alone does bread out of nothing or, or creation out of nothing, ex nihilo. What does Jesus answer? Well, you know, that, that would be pretty fun to do that. Yeah, maybe I should. What does Jesus say? Now he says, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You got that? Right? Is your problem materialism? Is your problem you don't have enough stuff? Come to my house. I have a lot of stuff and I'm miserable. I know, I'm just kidding. Right? The more stuff you have, it doesn't, you know, what does Mrs. Isaac show? He says, we're downsizing now. We're like, well, okay, throw out your stuff then, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we have all this stuff, right? We know this stuff. We have stuff piled up. It's not piled up, you know? Someday, girls, all these humble figures are going to be yours, right? You could have my china set. This is what they, okay? So, it, does a lot of stuff buy you happiness? Bread alone doesn't do it. At the, at the end of your life, they're going to be gathered around. They're going to go, hey, the guy had a lot of money. What a great, what a great guy. He was a miserable human, but he had a lot of money. Right? Especially if, if you get some of that money, then you're really going to like this guy, right? Well, bread, bread alone, money, you know, your, your bank account is not what it's all about, right? What is it all about? It's about the Word of God. What is the Word of God anyway? The Word of God is, uh, let me see, the Bible? Mm -hmm. Bonnie read this today. What is this? Genesis chapter 2 through 3, uh, 3 7. What is that? That's called the fall. What's the Bible about? Creation, fall, redemption, okay? This is the fall. And what does Satan do? Satan says to Eve, ready? He says, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. That's called the two lives of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. You won't die and you're gonna be like God. Is that true? No, no. You're a created being. You're not God. There's only one God and you're not it. That's, that's why people don't like to come to church. They don't want to be reminded. They want to be, you're like a, God, you're a goddess. Yeah, you're a God. No, you're not. It's a lie from, the, from, from Satan himself. 
right? You won't die and you'll be like God. No, you're not like God. There is one God and you're not yet. God is our creator. You are a created being. And so is Satan, an angel, a fallen angel, right? Very important, right? So, uh, okay, so, so, so the economic one. Okay, the next one, right? Then the devil takes Jesus to the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and places him on the pinnacle of the temple. We've been there. The Temple Mount, right, is where the Dome of the Rock is located. The Wailing Wall is over here where Wendy is. That corner over there is the pinnacle of the temple. And it's a huge wall. And you stand there and you look down, it's maybe 100 feet, 200 feet down to the valley floor. So what does Satan want him to do? He says, if you are the Son of God, again, he knows that he's the Son of God, throw yourself down. What's that? The leaping Lord, right? I can see it now. I, was, I meant to do this. I was going to announce last week, but I didn't get around to it, that, that after church day, I'm going to climb up on, the, on the, um, the steeple of the church and do a swan dive into the parking lot. It, 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 and make sure you have your iPhones ready. I'll be like, ta -da! Send your tax-deductible contribution to Pastor Mark Ministries, Pasadena, California. Are you kidding me? People love and crave signs and wonders, wonders and signs. They want to be entertained. Do we, they want to go to church and sing these awful verses that we sing in Lent? Nah, they want to be entertained. They want to have like a rock concert or something in church, right? They don't want to go through the liturgy with a purple, you know, the pyramids and they have the organ playing and, the, and you know, for the Psalms and the Bible. No, they don't want to do that. They want to be entertained. Well, worshiping God is not entertainment, right? Worshiping God is called the work of the people, right? So uh, we're, not, we're not here to be entertained. The leaping Lord. Again, Jesus could have been wildly popular by doing what? Manipulating religion. What? Do you mean there are unscrupulous people out there that might actually manipulate religion for fun and profit? Yeah. That's why you as Christians, you're members of a con this congregation, right? If I start doing wacky stuff or if someone who comes after me starts saying wacky things, you quietly... First of all, you say, did I really, did you really say that? Did you say that Christ didn't rise from the dead on Easter was only a rumor, right? If you hear that, ask the minister or the preacher, the teacher, and then if they won't change, get up and leave and go find a place where the gospel is preached. Because religion, people fall for this all the time. You have to be eternally vigilant. That's why you have to read the Bible. That's why you have to read the Book of Concord. Because you can't trust the leaders or the administration of the church or anybody. You can't trust anybody. Oh, you only trust the Bible and you trust God. That's the rule and the standard, not what the current trend or philosophy or something might happen to be. Right? So relig the religious temptation is extremely seductive, and a lot of people have been derailed by that, tempted in the wrong direction. Again, does Satan want you to worship this man hanging on the cross? No. Let's take down the cross. It's too depressing. Let's make positive and, and affirmative statements about things instead. That's not religion. That's apostasy, right? So Jesus then, uh, he's, you know, hey, be the leaping Lord here, right? And so, and so, and then what does Satan do? He quotes the Bible. Oh, well, that, that television evangelist, he must be, he's quoting the Bible that if I give money, you know, 10% of my income that somehow I'll get a hundredfold increase in my paycheck. That's called the prosperity gospel. Well, that is quoting scripture incorrectly out of context. What do you need to do? You need to read the Bible to know when these people are dropping these context dropping, the wrong verses to try to get you to send them money, right? You have to be eternally vigilant. And here, Satan says, well, his, his angels are going to give, you know, co concerning you, you know, not, his, their hands will bear you up if you, if you jump off the temple, right? So the angels will catch you. Now, what is that for? This is a quote from uh, Psalm 91, that it's supposed to be words of comfort to you. David is being pursued by his enemies, and he takes comfort in knowing God will protect him and guide him and lead. A mighty fortress is our God, Okay. Uh, you're not supposed to, so Satan is quoting this out of context. This is not a messianic verse, you know. You prove you're the Messiah by jumping off the temple. That, that's not what this is. It's a, it's a scripture twisting, okay? So you have to be careful, right? And Jesus says, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to test. Do we do this all the time? Yeah. 
why would God do this to me? Oh, uh, oh, you know, God, you have you don't have a guarantee that you know if you if you go to church once in a while that somehow you're immune from all diseases and all bad things, right? right? Bad things happen because we live in a broken and a fallen world. The world's messed up, and God did it. He saved and redeemed you through faith in Christ. That doesn't mean you have a guarantee from the bad stuff that happens in the world, right? But God is our shield and our protector, and we cling to him and him alone. And we don't put God to test, right? Well, since God let this happen to Uncle Fred, I don't believe in Uncle Fred anymore. I talk to people like this all the time. I don't go to church because, you know, uh, my mother died or something, right? They just don't like to come to church, right? So the third temptation is the, the political temptation, okay? So you've got economics, religion, and politics. It's a potent mix so far, isn't it? The third temptation. And three temptations... When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, our painting back here, remember? The, his inner circle of disciples were with him sitting there and they fell asleep because it's very late Thursday night, early Friday morning. Three times they had to go and say, Wait, pay attention, wake up, be with me here, I need your help. And they fell asleep. Three, three temptations, three, okay? So we have three temptations. So again, the devil takes them to a very high mountain and he shows them all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. Stop. What is this anyway? Okay? This is kind of the, he steps out of time and space. He takes Jesus along. And he says that all the kingdoms, what does that mean? All the kingdoms of the world? It means this. See this? This is uh, my favorite set of books. Will Durant, Story of Civilization. It's 11 volumes, right? I actually read this. It took me like 10 years to get through it all, right? And it starts out with ancient history and it goes all the way up to Napoleon. And it's different empires rising and falling and falling and rising and rising and falling. When the Satan says all the kingdoms of the world, he's talking about the Mongol Empire with Genghis Khan, six times larger than the Roman Empire. Mm. Jesus, it's yours for the taking. By the way, you can have the Roman Empire too. I'll throw that in. And don't forget about, so say the, you know, the Medo-Persians. Yeah, I'll throw that one in too. Oh, I'll even throw in the British Empire, 1915 to 1945. 25% of the world population was under the control of the British Empire. Hey, I'll even throw in the United States for it. You can have that too. I'll throw in the old Soviet Union and that huge empire. In other words, all the kingdoms that have ever existed in human history, five or 8,000 years of history, it's all yours, Jesus, right? And all you have to do, he says, if then again, right? All these are yours if you fall down and worship me. If you fall down and worship me, then all this will be yours. Okay, stop for a minute. Is Satan telling the truth? No. He's a liar. He's a liar. He's lying. The kingdoms of this world are not Satan's to give away. You got that? So it's sort of like, you know, everybody laughs about, oh, the stupid Indians, they sold Staten Island for $25. So look what it's worth now. $24, right? No, so, so well, is that true? Well, no, actually, it was the Canarsie Indians who sold the land to the stupid Dutch people. It wasn't their land. Mm. It would be like, you know, yes, I want to sell you an apartment block over in Kingston. And here, give me the money. Okay, well, I don't own that building over there, but I sold it to you. Right? So that's what Satan is doing. He's selling Manhattan Island for $24, but he doesn't own it. You see how that works? Satan is a liar. He's a liar. He's a liar. It's not, the, the kings of the world are not his to give away. So in the short run, Jesus could have signed the deal. Yeah. You think maybe politicians would like climb and crawl over each other to have an, a deal like this? Are you kidding me? There have been people that have been murdered to be the dog catcher of Hyde Park. Right? <laughs> politicians, right? It's like, yeah, I just, I just want to get the votes. Yeah, that's what it is. Well, all the kingdoms of the world? I mean, what would that be worth? It's a huge thing. But it's not Satan's to give away. Again, he's, he's a liar, isn't he? And to fall down and worship him, what does Satan really, really want? What does he really, really want? He wants you to think that Satan is God, and he actually he's greater than God, and he's more fun than God. God is so boring. Yes, to live a disciplined, focused life is boring. You want to be excited, don't you? Yeah, you want to do all kinds of bizarre things and, you know, tattoo your face and take the heroin and, you know, don't work and do all kinds of, you know, burn things in the streets and anarchy and chaos and rampage. Yeah, that's a great time. In the short term, it might be really fun, but in the long run, you're dead. He's got you. That's what he's after. A disciplined, focused life. 
where you go to work. You believe in God. You live a clean life. You try to be a good neighbor. You try to be a good You love God. You love your neighbor. That's no fun. You see how Satan works? He turns what is good. He makes it into evil. And what is evil, he calls it good. Satan is the great perverter and inverter. Everything is up. You ever notice that today everything seems to be upside down? Like things that we used to think are good are now considered evil, and things that are evil are now considered normal and good and wonderful for everybody to do? Yeah, well, that's a sign that somebody along the way bought the deal. Somebody sold out for the economics, the religion, and the politics, didn't they? They bought all three temptations, and that's why the world is messed up right now. Right? So what does Jesus say? Fall down and worship me. Right? <laughs> Jesus says, away with you, Satan. Away with you, Satan. Okay? Now, the names of Satan are extremely important. Here, I put this in here. Satan means the adversary. But what does that mean? Adversary means against God. Antichrist, against Christ. Adversaries, right? The other one that's important is the devil is, it means the slanderer, the liar, the accuser, diabolos, right? The devil, that's what that means. And the best one is the tempter. This is in uh, chapter four, verse seven. See that word, the tempter? Literally, the word means the presser, like the pressure, pressure salespeople, the pusher, the one that pushes the pushes the drug, pusher, pusher, pusher. That's what Satan does. He's pushing you, pushing you off the edge of the cliff. He's pushing you into a life of destruction and death. He's pushing you, he's pushing you, he's pushing you. Does Satan ever give up? Mm -mm. Satan never gives up. Satan never surrenders. Satan never apologizes. Satan never gives back territory. He pushes ahead and pushes ahead and pushes ahead. He's relentless. He works 24 hours, seven days a week. He's never going to apologize, never going to retreat, never going to admit you made a mistake. You keep pressing on, keep pressing on. That's what Satan does. He never gives up. So when this story ends, does, do we have like a happy ending? Then Jesus walked back into town and had a pizza immediately. And no. His three and a half years of the ministry is a constant, 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 constant attack from Satan. The temptation of Christ doesn't end, didn't end, right? And so how about for us? Well, we're Christians. That means we decided to be on God's side in the great struggle of history. We're on God's side. And we fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world? You mean the world isn't on our side? Yeah, we're salt and light in the world. You don't have to be a majority, but you do have to stand up once in a while and go, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna let that happen, right? We fight against the, the world's values are not our values. And the more our, the more our country abandons Christianity, the more you're gonna realize that we're an extreme minority here. But guess what? You don't have to be a majority. Salt and light goes a long way, right? And the flesh, again, we have the internal struggles constantly. That's what Lent's all about, right? You want to, like, work the program. Have some discipline in your life. Discipline is a good thing. In the short term, it's painful, but in the long term, you, you gain eternal life. You gain rewards. You gain sanity. You gain a productive life. That's what, that's what God wants for you, an abundant life. And ultimately, we fight against the devil. He's the author of all this chaos and confusion. He's the one who goes after Jesus. Imagine the, the audacity of this. Attacking Jesus and saying, are you really the son of God? Imagine that. Attacking Jesus himself. Do you think he's going to stop? Satan is going to stop and give you an exemption? You know? Oh, I'm too busy dealing with students at Bard College. I don't have time to come down and, and derail your miserable life. That's what Satan does. He doesn't stop. Right? So, what does Jesus say? away with you. Get out of here. When Peter says, oh no, no, we're not going to have, no, you can't go to Jerusalem and die on the cross. We're not going to let that happen. What does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Satan tries to derail Jesus at the beginning and at the end of his ministry. He tries to derail them all during his ministry, right? And as he gets closer and closer to the cross, he gets more desperate and more vicious. More vicious. Satan is vicious. And he says this. 
he, Jesus quotes scripture back to him and he says, worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Stop, what is that? That is a rephrasing of what you already know. The 10 commandments. What is the first commandment? No other gods before me. No other gods before me. You got this? If you got the first commandment down, the rest of them fall right into order. If you know who God is, really understand who God is, really, really understand who God is, Satan is not a problem. Mm -hmm. Satan is not God. You don't worship Satan. You don't worship anything, any created thing. You worship God and God alone. No other gods before me. What? Do not, oh, sorry. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You got that? That's the mission of Lent. That's our task as Christians. Remember the first commandment and work the program. Extremely important. Now we're gonna end here finally, right? You can tell I'm interested in this because I'd like to talk about this for you know like several hours here. Then the devil left him, not permanently, for a short time. He leaves him. And suddenly the angels came and they waited on Jesus and comforted him. Now why is that interesting? He's really, really famished. He's weak. He's tired. And angels come and they, and, they, and they are with him. Now, do we see this again at the end of the Gospel of Matthew? In the Garden of Gethsemane, our painting back here, tears are coming out as blood and sweat. If it's possible, take this cup away from me. All the pressure of the world is on this because he knows that he's going to be betrayed and crucified in a matter of moments. God sends angels to comfort and to be with him during that time. Is that an important thing to know? Yeah. yeah, we're not alone. We think we're alone. Oh, poor old me, I'm the last Christian in North America. Well, guess what, we're not alone. God sends angels, but he also sends other Christians to be with us, to be with us and stand with us during our time of need. You're going through a hard time in your life? Guess what, we have Christians here. We stand next to each other. We help each other during a time of need. We bail each other out. We help out. We stand with you. Sometimes just having a person with you is a tremendous gift. You don't have to say anything. Just be with the person. Be with the person. The angels are there with Jesus, and they, and they take care of him and wait on him. This is called the temptation of Christ. It's a very important thing to read, to study, to think about. It's the first Sunday in Lent. You want to focus on Christ during these next 40 days. Amen.